place. The Greek, in Greek, the spirit is referred to as the pneuma, the rock hakodesh Hebrew. For those who are interested in learning tongues, I recommend the Hebrew. It's so beautiful phonetically. The breath of God filled the entire house. And they saw tongues, verse 3, like flames of fire that separated and one rested on each of them. And all of them were filled. Hallelujah. They were not blown away by the wind, brethren. They were not tossed around the room. They were not hanging on for dear life. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in foreign languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a glorious day that was when God had again broken through the realm of humanity and had given us the promise, comforter. Interestingly enough, there are some rabbinic Jews who hold to the view that it was on the day of Pentecost, some 1400 years prior to the account in Acts, that the Israelites received the Torah on Mount Sinai. Now, of course, this is not explicitly stated in scripture, but based on what was reported in Exodus 19, from the time that the children of Israel left Egypt to the point where they came to the foot of the mount when the law was given. It is not a far-fetched assumption that this could have been on the day of Pentecost, which we know wasn't celebrated until the Israelites were settled in the land. Now, even though this can be considered to be pure speculation, it would be interesting to contrast the giving of the law on tablets of stone with the giving of God's Holy Spirit. That's a huge contrast, and I, and I don't want us to miss it. Whereas the law of God was given on tablets of stone, supposedly on the day of Pentecost, we see a magnification of this Old Testament event where the Spirit of God was given to dwell inside us. To do what? To cast aside the law? No, but the Spirit enables us to keep the law of God. And as a movement, although we seem to be growing, I don't think we give enough credence to the power of the Holy Spirit. As a result of our foundation in scholarship and doctrinal astuteness, we have this intellectual approach approach to Christianity. Because we have the ability to reason doctrine and we can confidently argue any position, we tend to downplay what it means to walk daily in the spirit. Now lately I've been doing some reflection during the remainder of the days on my own personal walk. I can confess that it has not been good. I always said that God was the most important figure in my life. But sad to say, that was only true as far as it was convenient for me to look to him. In other words, when things were going bad, I went on my knees. When I was shaken up by the circumstances of life, that is when I would call on his name. But when the battering and the beating eased up, I would put God back on the shelf. You have served your purpose. I did not say it in those exact words, but this is how I was living. The time I dedicated to God was minuscule. I made no time to read my Bible except in cases where I was studying doctrine. I made no time for prayer except in cases when I was blessing my meal. I made no time for the brethren except on occasions like Bible studies and weekly Sabbaths. My conversations, the type of music I listened to, they were both predominantly secular. I would say that the only times persons remember that I was a Christian was on Friday evenings and when I was missing from work during the week to celebrate a holy day. Brethren, I was unknowingly chasing after the approval of the world, the wealth that it had to offer, the status, the accolades, the pleasures, but I was unhappy. I was frustrated. I had a God-sized hole in my heart that I tried to stuff with material gain and worldly relationships, but I still felt miserable. I felt angry. And just like how King Saul felt tormented when the Spirit of God had left him, I began to ask myself, has the Spirit of God left me? And as I thought about what the day of Pentecost represents, our adoption into the family of God as first fruits, I wondered if I would have been among the chosen at the end of the age. And so I poured out my heart to God, confessing my sins, asking for his forgiveness in running after the things that seem so fleeting and meaningless, asking him to heal me. And at the end of that prayer, brethren, I felt lighter. I felt like a burden had been lifted, but I had a pain in my heart, like my chest was tightening. 
and I started to listen to some gospel music and the pain subsided. But whenever the music stopped, the pain slowly returned. I had emptied myself, but I needed to put something back. I needed to put God in my heart. And as I read about the account when the law was given on Mount Sinai, I wanted to gain some insight into what to speak about today. So I turned to Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, Sivan, when the day of Pentecost is supposed to be celebrated, when the children of Israel went forth out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. Moses went up and spoke with the Lord, and the Lord said to him, you saw what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Therefore, obey me and keep my covenant. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. In verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. With just 15 days remaining, this is a message I bring to you from the Lord, a message of consecration. Because if we are to anticipate the presence of the Lord on the day of Pentecost, if we are expecting to be refreshed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, then we must be prepared. We must therefore consecrate ourselves if we are to experience the full measure and power of the living God. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? There's a song that's popular right now talking about you are walking trophy. I'm not sure how many of you guys know it. You know it. All right. The laughter says it all. But to turn it on its head, God is saying you are a walking temple. Sister Kelly, you are a walking temple. Yes. Brother David, you are a walking temple. Yes. Sister Denise, you are a walking temple. Brother Parks, you are a walking temple. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be walking temples. And once you realize this, then that's the game changer. We begin to embrace our identity as children of the Most High, ambassadors of Christ. We begin to embrace our identity as first fruits. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Holiness is something that we need to bring back into how we worship the Creator. And to do this, we need to fully embrace and submit to the will and power of the Holy Spirit. Now at this point, I want us to look at some of the benefits of walking in the Spirit from an Old Testament perspective. Now many professing Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is a gift that was given only to this dispensation of New Testament. New Testament body of believers, but the Holy Spirit was definitely active from the very beginning. From as early as Genesis 1-2, it mentions that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the ocean, and the Spirit, the rock of God, moved on the face of the waters. The Spirit was introduced at the creation of the world. It is not a New Testament concept. The Holy Spirit has deep roots in Old Testament scripture. And as we go through different passages in the Old Testament, I will highlight the different roles that the Spirit can play in our lives. We look at Numbers 11. The Israelites were complaining to Moses, give us meat to eat. We remember all the good stuff we used to eat in Egypt. Now all we have is this manna. Now these were roughly two million people and Moses was burdened by the complaints. So he asked the Lord, verse 11, why did you bring all this trouble on your servant? Why haven't I found favor in your eyes? After all, they are putting the bur you are putting the burden of this entire people on me. Did I conceive these people or give them birth? Now, Moses was roughly around 80 years old. I mean, you can understand, he should be retired. So, the frustration is warranted. So this is what the Lord said in verse 16. Appoint for me 70 elders, and I will place my spirit in them so that they will bear some of the burden. And so brethren, the first thing I want us to, to note is that the spirit brings relief from our burdens. Amen. Now some of us who would have been faced with different adversities can attest that it would have been difficult to see thing, how things could work out for your good had it not been for your reliance on the spirit. On the other hand, 
hand, some of us are still struggling to make headway because of our dependence on self. And self alone cannot effectively fight against the spiritual wickedness in high places that seek to do us harm. As a result, you're constantly worn down by the issues of life, the issues of sin, issues of disappointment and hopelessness. And so you feel burdened. But if you would just submit to the power of the Holy Spirit, you will feel relief. If you would just cast your cares on the Lord, as Psalm 52, 55 verse 22 tells us, He will sustain you, for He will never let the righteous be shaken. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 reiterates the point. Cast all your cares on Him, because He cares for you. Numbers 11 verse 25. When the Spirit rested on the 70 elders, they prophesied. However, two men among the elders that were appointed had remained in the camp, and they had not gone out. They stayed behind and prophesied in the camp. But when it was reported that this had happened, Joshua said to Moses, Master, stop them. Moses replied in verse 29, Are you jealous on account of me? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Brethren, this is my wish also, that you will all be refreshed by the outpouring of God's Spirit and experience Him in a way that you had never experienced Him before. Now, God desires to give you rest. He desires to relieve you of all the pressure and pain that comes with the life, this life. If only you would let Him. Brethren, the Spirit of God brings relief. Now, the Spirit also gives us power to overcome the enemy. In Judges 3, we see that the Israelites were oppressed by nations around them. Verse 9 says that the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up Othniel, the son of Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit, the rock of God, was on him, and he went out to battle, and he went out to war against the enemy, and was victorious. Now when we're walking in the Spirit, brethren, we have the power not only to fight against the enemy, but also to be victorious. When we understand that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, when we begin to see situations and people through spiritual lenses, that the brother or sister that sins against you is influenced by some higher spiritual power who just wants to take away your joy, only then will you overcome. Only then will you begin to see spiritual strongholds fall. Only then will you conquer that which is oppressing you. Judges 11 also speaks about another man by the name of Jephthah. He also was a valiant soldier according to the scripture, but he was the son of a prostitute. It so happened that when his brothers grew up, they kicked him out of the house because he was the son of a different woman. And verse 3 records that he lived in a territory where worthless men gathered around him. Here's a man that was rejected and cast aside. Circumstances pushed him to live in the company of what we Jamaicans would call waste people. And when his family shunned him, God regarded him. He sent his spirit to Jephthah, a man who seemed to be the most unlikely and most unqualified person, and turned him into a hero. He, so just in case you thought that you were a nobody and that God doesn't care for you, and he doesn't care about what you're going through, I'm here to say that God has acknowledged you. He knows your background and has seen your current estate, and he wants to use you. God takes great delight in using what society calls worthless to accomplish his will and his purpose, only that you will be open to receive his spirit. Jephthah, born of a prostitute, received victory over his situation and in Israel, and became a hero in the face of adversity. The spirit, brethren, gives us power to overcome the enemy. The third point, the Spirit transforms us. In 1 Samuel 9, we meet Saul. God has chosen him to be king over Israel. Saul himself is humbled, but shows no confidence. We see in verse 21 that when it is revealed to Saul that he should become king, he responded like this. Am I not a descendant of Benjamin from the least of the tribes of Israel? Isn't my family the least important of all the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me like this? So then Samuel took some oil, chapter 10, which is symbolic of the spirit, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be captain over his inheritance? 
in verse 6 of first verse Samuel 10 it was foretold to Saul that the spirit the rock of God will come upon him and he will prophesy with the bands of prophets and be changed into a different person we have this perception of Christianity that when we come to God it is okay to still be yourself we stress the come as you are which leads to the unconscious thought that we are to stay as we are but if we should think of ourselves as anointed by God it is only then we will begin to see the transformation when somebody has been slandering you and you know you have some information on them that could bury them and you think about responding in the most unchristian way possible speak to yourself in that moment and say has not the Lord anointed me when you're struggling with a sin and you're faced with a temptation following Brother Elliot's sermon, you have the desire, you have the opportunity, and the temptation presents itself. In that moment when you feel like you're just about to give in, in that fraction of a second, speak to yourself, has not the Lord anointed me? When a woman, you, when as a woman, you have to make a tough call, children are crying in the night, they're hungry, they have exams this month, and they have to study, but you know a little man down the road, him like you. He doesn't have much, but he has enough to take care of your needs so long as you satisfy his. Woman of God, when you think about giving him a link, speak to yourself, has not the Lord anointed me? Men, we have urges too. When you think about a young woman that shows you ratings, she has her own place, so you don't have to worry about parents. And she doesn't have a next man, so you don't have to worry about that either. When you think about paying her a visit, you've been holding out for so long, you've been good for so long. You think you deserve to be bad at least once in a while, just before you make that call to ask her if you can come over. Man of God, say to yourself, has not the Lord anointed me? God has called us to be not to be ourselves, but something far greater, brethren. He has a purpose for our life that far exceeds what you can imagine. But if you should empty yourself and allow yourself to be filled by the Spirit, the mind, the breath of the living God, then you will experience the transformation in your life. Brethren and friends, I believe that, that my time has run out. We have only begun to scratch the surface of how the Spirit can move in your life. But it is my sincere prayer that you will open your hearts and minds to the word that God has sent forth today. That we will begin to depend more on the Spirit's guidance and direction. I leave you with the words of Jesus in John 4 verse 23 to 24. Yet a time is coming, and is now here, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Indeed, the Father is looking for people like that to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. As we approach the great day of Pentecost, let us use the time that is left to recommit, to consecrate ourselves, and be prepared for the time when we shall see say, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen.